Tony writes, the problem is the media and what is portrayed and how it is reported. The media just plays into what will get hype and doesn't address the underlying issues, old antiquated laws and bad laws. The media does nothing to help to try to fix the issues. It just tries to inflame them. I agree there's much to change that needs to happen, but there are better ways than to incite people to hurt others. Um, Jericho writes, Hate Inc. by Matt Taibbi is a fantastic book. I don't share his politics, but his subject is spot on. Uh, he's a great reporter and his Substack. I pay five bucks a month to read Matt Taibbi. Um, so Tony continues, what I'm trying to say is the media deflects and amplifies issues to sell more papers and get more hits. It does nothing to help fix things. You're right, and you're partly wrong. And I will, I will say that the media is not helpful as a whole, right? So if I think there's two ways to break this down. First, there is the media, right? There's, again, going back to that stereotyping the group. And you look at the media as kind of like if you're not paying attention, the block and when you think the media, just the dashboard of what you see on your social media and the mainstream institutions and, you know, your, your vision. If you're if you're listening to Ben Shapiro every day and that's your only view of what the media is, then you have a very like, you know, a homogenous view of what the media is. If you're only reading media matters every day, you have a very homogenous view of what the right wing media is, you know? And so for the sake of like trying to break down arguments, we will often group together people and argue against that. And the problem is when you say like all black lives matter are Marxist or all tea party are Nazi, like, right. Like you, you are, you are doing and an, you're doing intellectual damage to your credibility because you're not breaking it all out. Right. The media is yes, the media, but there's thousands of outlets, right? There's tons of great journalism out there who is trying to explain the problem. Radley Balco is one of those people that we go to. Right. Like there are plenty of politicians who are just, you know, they're trying to get ahead in politics and they'll say and do whatever they need to do. And you know, there's plenty of media members who are just like, like, I'm not a big Tim Pool fan. I think that Tim Pool comes to a conclusion and then finds evidence to support the conclusion he's already reached. Right. Like that's why I'm against Donald Trump and this mail in ballot stuff. He decided that the election was going to be corrupt no matter what before a vote was cast. He has no evidence to back up his side. It's just that he's going to repeat that into reality. And then the right will, the right leaning media will do what they did with. And then the left media will get offended by that. And the New York times will do articles about Sean Hannity and the daily wire and how they're all like conflating all this stuff. And then everybody fights and fights and fights. And then Donald Trump gets reelected because it's just a foregone conclusion that the, the election was stolen. You know, it well, sort of happened with Hillary Clinton. There's a lot of media so, outlets who are. Hello. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm listening. Okay, okay. There's a lot of media outlets out there that do have like a branch that are trying to do the in-depth dis investigation and discussion of things like that. I mean, I I know the Atlantic is not a big favorite by some people in the libertarian right community, but it's it, they do a really good job of doing those deep investigative type of things. There's good people trying to do documentaries. It used to be better. Because local media was was more of where people got their news, you know, before CNN and we had cable news systems, right? People were getting their news from their local um, news sources, and they would get packages about certain topics, but they would also do in depth about what's going on with, you know, the you know the mayor or this councilman or this you know things that were happening locally, and you would start to see really good in-depth reporting that way and it, all of that's kind of gone now because of the centralization of the media mm -hmm. right so decentralizing it back again is going to open up a lot of those areas but the there are still places out there doing this and i know like npr and and like the atlantic i was talking about uh, uh, another good example is um glenn greenwald's you know the intercept yeah, stuff yeah. and um so there are places you can find that have that are doing what you're, you're talking about doing. But if people are just turning on TV and watching CNN or watching Fox news, they're not going to get those. That's yeah. not the place to go get that information. You, that's where you hear people trying to set up, you know, I think, I think it kind of started with like point counterpoint, 
Mm. If you remember that old show on PBS, that's where we got the left on one side and the right on the other, and we're going to hash it out. And well, it's it a popular it's, format. Yeah, it's way right? cheaper. You get better yeah. ratings, and it's way cheaper to just hire a couple opinion he talking heads yep. than it is to send uh, one of the best guys out there right now. His name is Tim Alberta. He writes for Politico, and he goes to places like he's been in Wisconsin. He lives in Michigan. And he is going to all these swing states and doing all these interviews for Politico magazine and Politico. And he wrote a book called American Carnage, which is considered kind of like the best reporting on the Republican Party and how it ended up at Trump. And it's on the ground, immersive journalism. And he's a writer, you know, where you have Vice, where they send a reporter and a camera crew out to Syria to, during the war and they do their HBO show. Like all that, uh, you know, 60 minutes where you've got a camera crew and you're sending them to a hotel and they're there for four days. And, you know, then all that's very expensive. Right. Mm -hmm. If you just hire me to come argue with you two and I'm responsible for showing up because I live in New York and we just meet at the studio and we do it and we yell at each other. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get better ratings. I'm going to pay less. All right. I got to pay you health insurance, but I'm paying three people to just show up and argue instead of paying three people for a hundred days of hotel rooms a year, you know, and, and then and, all, all the expenses and, that come with that. And you start bringing back the same people. So they get into these patterns. They know what the other person is going to say. They, they basically invent conflict in their conversations, even though privately they probably might agree with each other on, on a lot of it but they can't do that on the camera. Right. So that's all acting at some point where people are saying, you know, uh, you disagree here with me on this and I'll, I'll argue this side and anybody, any good debater will be able to tell you that they can take a side one way or the other, whether they believe it or not. And they can argue, you know, that position, because that's what you're trained to do, right? That you're trained to be able to, to make the case, whether you, whether you personally agree with one side or not. So you see a lot of that in the talking heads where they just get up there and they know that what they're saying is complete garbage, but it creates conflict and it creates right. the, the show. And it's, it's like um, reality TV. I mean, all that stuff is scripted ish. You know, let's let's have them do this and see what happens. Let's put them in this situation and tell them to to give us the best result. Um, you're not seeing reality. You're seeing fake reality, just like you're seeing fake arguments on on these shows. Um, and it's it's destructive to to really get into it and watch it too much. That's why that you matters. Know, Taibi book. Yeah. So Tony says, I'm sorry, I'm implying the mainstream media and then says, and that's the problem. People react to the first thing they see. They don't actually look into it. Politicians like Donald Trump take advantage of you not looking into it. Mm -hmm. Media outlets like the Daily Caller and the and Raw Story and Huffington Post take advantage of you not looking into it. You are the problem. Now, not you, dear listener, because you are here. You obviously like long format, boring you like facts, which is totally nerdy, you know, and I'm going to put a couple of research papers into our show notes. Like, you know, if you, you probably like the dispatch or Vox and you like long stories, like you're not the typical person, but you, thanks to government, thanks to democracy, thanks to whatever form of the state you want to call it are chained to the people who don't read as opposed to having the ability to privately coalition with people who do read and do take this stuff seriously. And they live the consequences of their decisions out there. And we try to think through the problems and we have our own little anarchist community. Like that's what libertarianism is about is about breaking apart from the idiots. <laughs> Even though I know we will have idiots in my version of society, it's that I want to give the idiots as few tools to hurt me or hurt Brianna Taylor or hurt Harry or hurt Reinhold or you as possible, right? That's what libertarianism is about. It's not about perfecting people. It's not about a utopian society. It's about having to suffer the consequ less consequences of, uh, of idiots. But the media, the problem with the media is not the media. It's not them. It's you. The problem is not the left. It's you. The problem is you are making choices to incentivize the media to keep giving you that crap. You are on social media just reading the headline and not the article. Oh, well, it's, like I got mad at uh, – I'm sorry, Bissell, <laughs> uh, but uh, Wall Group member, I just said, for fuck's sake, read the article. And he's like, hey, Wald. So I'm just going to keep repeating all the lies about Breonna Taylor I've read because it's paywalled, so I'm not going to inform myself. I can't afford $5 a month to be informed. Uh -oh. 
and so I got mad and I apologized yeah. to him. But, uh, well, and the thing too, I, yeah, it's it's if if we weren't watching CNN and watching Fox and watching these horrible shows, it, and buying into it, then they would go away and they would change. Right? Yeah, and the same with reality. Everybody complains about reality TV, but reality TV makes the money because right. people watch it. Right. You know, guilty you, pleasure type stuff. So two hundred and fifty dollars a month on cable. You'll spend two hundred and fifty dollars a month for that cable package. Yeah. Ah, I can't pay five dollars to support this journalist or podcast that I like. Right. Uh, yeah, I don't want to give five dollars to Washington Post because they're they lie about Trump. So why would I do that? Right. Which forces this awful cycle of them having to make money off of ads. And so right. they make money off of ads, they have to make money off the clicks then. So now it's shorter and shorter stories because they need clicks because it's ad revenue, because you don't want to give them money. And they're incentivized to take ad money from people like defense contractors. Advertising does influence on a certain level the what you report, what stories you choose, how it's crafted. It just does. Like it's, they, there are firewalls, and there. And I'm not a journalist hater. Like uh, on the spectrum of people that cry leftist media and the media sucks, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, uh, I think uh, like it's take one red pill, not the whole bottle. You know, it's degrees. Like. Yes, there are problems with the media, but if you go too far with I don't trust the leftist media, you end up being completely bamboozled by politicians that want to control your mind. Right. And so you can't you can't ignore the Washington Post because the Washington Post reports things that are true that you need to read. Yep. And then you can go and read the Daily Wire and reconcile the differences in this. Right. right. Like that's, that's, that's that's the best way to go. Yeah. Right. And and it's okay to understand the like Washington's Post is owned by Amazon. That's cool. Understand that. Alphabet owns Google, owns YouTube. Understand these things. Understand that these big corporations are, are ordered to this so you can understand that bias, but you should be able to read it and understand and pull that information out of it that you need. And, and you see you see the how the advertising can really start affecting, you know, what what comes out of that you're even seeing that with joe rogan's going on right now right so he moves over to spotify yeah. now you have people at spotify are trying to curb his conversations or try to change how he does his business um and that's why i think uh, as much as uh, i have a love-hate relationship with no agenda they have the model right right mm -hmm. um it's just a case of in and it's kind of partially in their in their case where they have to kind of cater to getting people to give them money. Uh, they do a pretty good job of keeping themselves going for that. So they don't have to worry about editorial content. Um, but I think sometimes they also play up things in a way to make it more interesting so that they get more, more donations too. So there's a, there's a good and bad side to all of that, but you know, that's the problem is that advertising does play into it and we need to support more independent stuff. We need to support more uh, support the people who are doing the long form discussions who are doing the putting out the documentaries that are really good in-depth documentaries and, and get your, you know, just stay away from the talking heads because they're just trying to convince you of something that um, they believe and they want you to believe. This stuff really matters because the problem with what's happening right now with the election, we're going to talk a lot about legitimacy next week in that word. I wanted to do this episode first because to Brianna Taylor is a breakdown of legitimacy. And for many people in minority communities, the government never had any legitimacy because it doesn't represent them. You know, if, if you are, you're talking about police abolition and th like there was a very white suburban reaction to police abolition, right? Well, that's not, we can't do that because we need the police because the police need to do this. The reality, as I've said forever, is you, you have visions of how the police ought to operate. You have visions of what how what the police do because you've bought into the idea that they are there to serve and protect you and that when you come home and there's a burglary happening in your house well you need a, a police officer to come and save you from that situation 
When in reality, what happens 99% of the time is you come home and your house has had has been broken into and your shit's gone. And then you call the police and the police get there two hours later and take a report and then they leave. And then you never hear anything again. You never get your stuff back. It's pay, insurance pays it off. You live in a state of police abolition. People in inner city look at the police abolition idea and go, yeah, no shit. I don't call the police. I don't have police protecting me. Why would I call the police? They're just going to shoot me. You know, because that happened to my cousin or that happened over here. Like the personal experiences of people who live in the communities, uh, like in, in, in urban communities, like you go to LA, there's I, like there's security guards in Jack in the Box. And I'm sitting and there's private gates around every house in LA when you drive around it. And you go, why is this? Oh, because the police, the LAPD is too big to function. And they don't do anything. You live in a state of anarchy, basically. There is you, you are holding on to a fake idea, right? And so the the instead of just admitting reality, we want to tell ourselves and have these fake fights and mobilize against each other. And it's if we don't, if we let if we don't let Donald Trump steal this election, the leftists are gonna come and rape our wives and take over our our AMC movie theaters and make us wear masks. And it's just going to be awful. So we need to just let him steal the election because we can't let them steal the election. Break. Like what you don't understand is the breakdown in inner city communities and uh, between the police and the people that they allegedly protect and serve. That's a breakdown of legitimacy of political legitimacy. It's a breakdown of stability. And you're now starting to see that spread into the the other parts of society, and I'm I'm gonna say this frankly, like the point of the suburbs, and you can look this up. This is the history of suburbs. Our 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 white like Levittown, okay, Levittown, New Jersey, first suburb. Men come home from the World War II. They get the GI Bill. They get loans. They move into Levittown. They they can get loans to to build that house. They have that first cornerstone of generational wealth in that new home. Mm -hmm. Blacks weren't allowed to move to Levittown. They didn't get loans. They didn't get that initial injection of cash. That like you go look at Frederick Douglass. I saw Frederick Douglass's uh, grandchildren reading. I think like the Emancipation Proclamation or something on Juneteenth, mm -hmm. and like the recording, the video recordings are like on Upper West Side penthouses. Because Frederick Douglass's grandchildren are killing it financially thanks to Frederick Douglass having that early ability to build wealth. Mm -hmm. And so generationally that trickled down. And so people moved into the suburbs because the minorities started to move in of any variety. And so they moved to the suburbs. And then all of a sudden, why is he, meaning Harry, driving around in our neighborhood? Pull them over. And so the the message is clear. Mm, you're not really welcome here, you know. And so, but we've lived in our bubbles of stability for a long time. That's starting to break down because the legitimacy of the state is breaking down, which leads to a very tumultuous, scary situation. And the Breonna Taylor situation as white people start waking up to what's happening in communities in which they don't live, go, that's not right. This system's fucked. We need to change it. And those of you who are holding on to, we need to keep the system as is are going to lose the fight, right? Like there's just no way around it. Like drug laws are going to get repealed. We're going to change the no knock raids. We're going to change qualified immunity and you can fight and be on the wrong side of ending the drug war. That's your choice, but you're going to lose. Because the majority of the country is no longer in agreement with drug laws work. We need to we need to send militarized police into drug communities and kill Breonna Taylor, who's an innocent victim, because they have not been responsible with the power. The judge wasn't responsible with the power. The police weren't responsible with the power. The, the district attorney and the prosecutors haven't been responsible with their power. They've lost legitimacy with the population that, that they represent. All of us who study the American Revolution knows what happens next. And so then all of a sudden you get the counter-revolutionaries and the tensions rise. And then you get Kyle Rittenhouse and then you get battles on the streets. And all of a sudden, the tension that you see between Kyle Rittenhouse and Antifa, the Proud Boys versus Antifa, 
That's happening in a centralized small location in Wisconsin or Seattle in a very small geographic area. But what is about to happen, what happens with, you know, ending every time you change the constitutional order, you change the effects on the system in relation to the people. You direct elect senators, which leads to the end of the filibuster judicially, that which leads to, you know, Amy, then the Republicans say one thing in 2016, do another, which leads to adding two more states or packing the courts, which leads to, which leads to, which leads to. And each side starts going, you are responsible for my misery. I'm going to fight you. The Republicans with the, the Republicans are basically saying to you in 2020, we no longer believe in a constitutional government. We no longer believe in the constitutional order. We are admitting to you that we no longer believe in limited government. We are walking away from that because the left walked away from it a long time ago. We need to walk away from it too. And now we're admitting this is a power politics state which is the most powerful government in the history of humanity with the most weapons and the most money and the most resources, most to lose. And all of a sudden, that pure power struggle that takes place between the Proud Boys and Antifa gets put into law. And it's no longer affecting Kyle Rittenhouse and the five people in front of him. It's affecting 370 million people. And the legitimacy breaks down further. Donald Trump, and we'll we'll get right into this uh, next week in more in depth. But Breonna Taylor is a crisis of legitimacy because of the way that the state acts, and the people who are on the streets are saying you are an illegitimate government, change or else. And that is the right of the people per the Declaration of Independence. And so, what you get sucked into when you have two pure power political gangs <laughs> fighting over the gun is it tit for tat it's tit for tat between antifa then the proud boys form and then kyle rittenhouse and then it's the next one and then it's the next one and then that gets shut sucked into the structural system of government and then all of a sudden you've got it affecting 370 million people there's going to be a lot of people that will not view the supreme court as a legitimate organ so the left in California says we no longer recognize Donald Trump's second term or his Supreme Court because Scalia may retire or, or Thomas may retire or die. Breyer is 62. Mm -hmm. If Trump gets a second term, there may be two more seats that fall to the right. So now all of a sudden you've got – let's just take the, the, the legitimacy crisis of Donald Trump not wanting to respect the vote. Donald Trump says it's close. He, he, he loses by a thin margin he says i'm not leaving and all of a sudden it's a choice of joe biden's constitution or donald trump's constitution and the military and police forces and the 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 what we call the the establishment powers the state governments the local governments they all side with joe biden's constitution but then there's the three percenters there's the Kyle Rittenhouses. There's everybody else who goes, uh, the Oath Keepers. They go, I'm, so, I'm siding with Donald Trump's constitution. Well, then that's pure power politics at play. That's the danger of, of where we could head if where we probably, I, I don't want to say we will head, but like when a government overreaches in the way that it did with the Breonna Taylor case and loses legitimacy, the stakes are very high. When we start to give in to Donald Trump's like lies about the ballot, because he's lying, go read the Atlantic article that I'll put in the show notes if you want to read ahead for next week. He's just not telling you the truth about the ballots. The ballots are secure. The amount of voter fraud, according to the Republican Heritage Foundation, is 0.0000000.2% or something crazy like that. Like those seven ballots that they found in Philadelphia is part of that marginal error. It is not a proof of a conspiracy. Donald Trump, in my opinion, is a fascist-leaning person. But because the American checks and balance system of, of government, it, it, it doesn't allow a fascist-leaning president like Donald Trump to have real power because there's so many checks on that power. There's, uh, this is why you don't want to get rid of the Electoral College because Donald Trump can either 
fuck with the Electoral College, which is less likely, or the Electoral College can be the backstop to electing a Donald Trump. And so Donald Trump, what fascists or what dictators or authoritarians usually do, like in Russia or everywhere in the history of authoritarians, what they do is they rig the vote. They stuff the ballot box. But because there's 5,000 counties that all use similar systems but have different operations, it is completely impossible for somebody like Donald Trump to rig the election, which means it's entirely impossible for the left to rig the election. So use your brains, right? Like Donald Trump is a person that if he could, he's telling you, he's saying it. He said, my win was rigged. I actually won the popular vote if it hadn't been for all those illegal votes. He said that in 2016, like, or, or 2017, like, yeah, he didn't think yeah. his own win was like he's so you you because you don't read because you don't go and find out the facts because you don't know how the system works because you don't know about Amy Coney Barrett and abortion because you don't know how uh, laws are crafted and what what you know judicial precedents are are implemented or because you don't know how police procedure works in the Breonna Taylor case you get mad that they weren't charged with murder or you go they got off at a technicality that's good because you don't know how ballots are harvested because you don't know no no and all this is easy for you to understand if you get involved and read and read widely and because you don't it leads to a crisis of legitimacy it leads to more violence. It leads to more breakdown. It leads to enshrining that into law. Public opinion is important because what public opinion says is okay gets enshrined into law. And when you say public opinion says it's okay to just keep kids in concentration camps at the border, it gives license for them to do a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And when you have a pure power state, one side eventually loses. And then you end up with China that just has... Reveal, it's been revealed that 400 concentration camps for Uyghurs. Mm -hmm. A pure political, a pure power state is not something you want to live in. So you better start paying attention because it's it's a it's a the Brianna Taylor legitimacy crisis is a canary in the coal mine, and it's it's important to pay attention to. We gotta. We got to wrap up. We'll do. A, I don't know if we want to. We'll, I'll talk to them off air if we're going to restart another episode to talk about the debate commission or we're going to do one Monday night. But um, we got to end this episode because it's already two and a half hours. So, uh, final thoughts, uh, Reinhold. Um, just to, to go on to what you were saying just a minute ago about uh, power politics and what fascist kind of situations do and rigging the vote. The one other thing that they do is they try to um, subvert the rule of law and, and use the, the, you know, the law and order that's in place uh, with with people like maybe a Bill Barr who goes in and and starts um, corrupting that whole uh, process so that uh, the law is now being used to assist and defend the people who um, are friends of the of those in power and it is used to attack and destroy the enemies of the people in power and that's uh, another thing that happens and we're seeing taking place too so uh, just be cautious be aware look at what's going on read um, get involved break out of the left right mindset and start paying attention to power versus people mm -hmm. right. authoritarianism Harry? versus uh individualism yep um i think uh spangle touches on this a whole bunch is if you question or how the validity of the the votes are counted like that all you can you can easily one volunteer for election day to go that there to help out the polls you can even help like with, with the county i think this system is so corrupt and managed by george soros that you can go volunteer yep and sit at your polling place and watch all the ballots like you can literally go be a judge you can call like everybody's old so they're looking for people right now if you are so concerned about your vote not counting and you think i'm crazy even though i've served on a state commission called the help america vote act commission as the libertarian representative despite being a part of two recounts mm -hmm. that ended with three and 14 
vote difference, despite hundreds of elections over like well dozens of elections that I participated in, oversaw as a reporter and a political consultant. Like, if you really think, even though my experience, oh, it's 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 just your experience. You can't say that's the truth everywhere. Guess what? You can go volunteer, Harry. You can go volunteer and be part of the corruption. And what you're going to see is exactly what I've been saying. And you're going to see that I'm right. And I will accept my public apology. Right. Yeah. Yep. Please go go volunteer. Go do that. Because the real voter fraud happens before the votes is even casted. Um, we'll get to this later. Is The vote fraud is the polls. I'm not, like you're saying, we're not reflecting the ballot. And the debates not also reflecting the ballots. So that is, <laughs> that's where the real voter fraud happens. Before yeah, you even cast it. It's the straight ticket voting. It's the stuff we talked at the beginning. That's where the ba- that's where the voter fraud starts. It's gerrymandering. It's tr- districts drawn by politicians. Yep. It's straight uh, you know, ballot access restrictions. Like that's the voter fraud. That's the voter disenfranchisement. Yep. But the the a lot of ballots are always handled by two people of both of different parties, judges, locked up like mm-hmm. your vote you, you know, with absentee mail in vo- voting, it the, typically it gets cast out by 20 percent so like it goes through machines and they scan between your driver's license signature your voter id signature your voter registration signature excuse me and they compare that to the ballot and they have one scan and then they have a second scan for problems and then they have a third scan like mail-in voting is not a problem and anybody who tells you like mail-in voting and absentee voting which are basically the same thing is rife with fraud is completely full of shit and they don't know what they're talking about. And you should not, you should question them. Like you should literally go, how can you be a political commentator and know so little about the basic function of voting? Because they don't know what they're talking about. And you can prove me wrong by going and volunteering as a judge, as a watcher. If you are part of a Republican, Democrat, or Libertarian party, like here in Indiana, I can call my local clerk and say, uh, you know, the, your county chairman of the Libertarian Party in Indiana can call up the clerk and go, we need watcher cards. And I can get a watcher card, which allows me to then go into any precinct or polling place in the county and literally stand there and watch over people. Because if you work for a political party, you get calls from your supporters and they go, hey, there's something funny going on at the ballots here. And then a lawyer who worked for one of the two parties, usually both parties show up to that precinct. And watch over it. And the problem is usually a judge or a volunteer for the clerk doesn't understand what's going on. A voter has been disenfranchised and the the judge or or the watcher for the party, the lawyer, comes in and says X, Y, and Z. The clerk doesn't know what they're talking about. The check and balances, the state election division. All of this stuff, all of these processes that are somewhat standardized across the nation are all designed for balance to enfranchise as many voters as possible. So, like, it's all right there if you go watch it. I've watched it for 20 years, and I have no, absolutely no doubt that my vote counts. You know, this is the first year where the Republican Party is fucking with votes so hard and manipulating the system because the only way for Donald Trump to win is to use the 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 election laws and the ballots and the mail, like the Texas GOP is suing the Republican governor of Texas because he wanted to give an extra week for deadlines because of the mail problems. Donald Trump fucks with the post office, which delays the week, the mail by weeks. The governor of Texas wants to make sure as many people can vote in Texas, which is a swing state. And the Republican party of Texas sues him saying that's not appropriate. We want as few people to vote. And you just go, why are we believing Donald Trump when in in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Florida, Texas? It's the Republican Party. The Republicans in Wisconsin, um, the, the, uh, the Green Party wanted to get on the ballot. They were disorganized. A Republican law firm reached out to them. And then had them wait to file their challenge to the printed ballots until the day, like the deadline, basically, and tried to get an injunction to keep. And 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 Wisconsin would have been would have had to print all of their paper ballots over, because a Republican law firm tried to dis to, to fuck up that. Like it's hard enough 
with all the the paper ballots and absentee ballots with the pandemic and the 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 demand is like two three times it's the republican law firm in wisconsin trying to prevent people in wisconsin a swing state from voting and you can let your little butthole pucker that i'm criticizing republicans and saying they're corrupt because you used to vote republican but now you call yourself a libertarian but you're too afraid to let go of the binky that is your former party but this is who is doing who is doing the voter fraud this time like i i, I know you found seven ballots in pennsylvania but that doesn't even come close to the amount of lawsuits that Republicans are filing in all these swing states to prevent people from voting because they think probably rightly that the more voters that turn out, the worse it is for them because they think that misinformed voters vote Democrat. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we'll end with Jericho. Um, she says, I believe it's she pictures of she, um, the government depends on the ignorance of the people. If the majority understood the power versus the people, there would have already been a modern day revolution. It's coming. And it's the job of every libertarian to prepare. Because in a pure power state, it's very easy for an authoritarian figure to say, I know we have hyperinflation. Trust me, I will fix it. I know that le the left is scary. Trust me, I will fix it. And when people, st liberty thrives in stability. When I was executive director from 08 to 12, we had a very stable economy, society, even in the middle of the, like, all things considered, even during the Great Recession, things were fairly stable. And you look at these massive gains. Do you expect that if people are hungry and if people are broke and people are angry that they're going to turn to anarchy, like in our version of it? The, the libertarian vision of the world, or are they going to turn to somebody that will punish the people that made them hurt? So culture sets the, the political environment. And so you've got to be informed and you've got to be sharing things like this show. You've got to be talking about liberty. That's why we're doing the Liberty Explained po podcast. And I, I don't have time for another podcast. I have a life and a girlfriend and college and this podcast and my job and another podcast and another podcast and a business I want to start. And I don't have time for another podcast, but I don't see an alternative because time is running out. So if you people don't share it, I'm just not going to do it anymore because then it's not worth any <laughs> go Liberty .com. We're trying to help give you the tools to set the ability for us to reset to something that is workable because where, where we're at is not workable. It's not legitimate. It's, it's, it's just going to, and it has the potential to get much worse. So, all right, with that, thank you both for joining me. Thank you all who are watching and we will see you again very soon.